Welcome to the Focus Sessions, Africa's online safety TV show, broadcasting once per month on this frequency. Aviasist has been leading, building and supporting safety promotion in African aviation since 1995. We provide you insights in the exciting world of safety and its professionals. And as you know by now, we make watching the Focus Sessions even more interesting for you by giving you a chance to win 100 US dollars in each episode. And we do this for two reasons. First, it gives you an insight in what inspires my guests here at the table. And the second reason, of course, is it gives you a chance to win 100 US dollars. You'll see a web address at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and at that page, you can submit the three letters that I'll give you throughout the broadcast. And that, together, form a three-letter code. Every 10 minutes or so, uh, we'll show you one of the favorite books of a guest here at the table. All you have to do is write down the first letter of the first name of the author. You'll end up with a three-letter code. And you enter those three letters on the Google form and then click Submit. You can only submit your three-letter code until 15 minutes after the end of this focus session. And then from amongst the correct answers, we'll draw one lucky winner and send that person her or his $100 by mobile money. We'll announce the winner on our LinkedIn page, so that's a good reason to follow us as Aviasist on LinkedIn. Now, over to the topic of today. Safety performance indicators are essential to evaluating the success of an aviation organization's safety management efforts. There's a saying amongst auditors in the management systems community that measurement is at the heart of management. In other words, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. I'm joined here at the table today by Adrian Young from consultancy firm 270, Marvin Nangarira, and my uh, regular partner in safety promotion or partner in crime, I don't know what I should say, <laughs> Chamsu Andirin. Um, Marvin, let me start with uh, you. An air traffic controller in, in Zimbabwe and South Africa for many years. And then an even more remarkable step, not just going across the borders in Africa, but becoming an air traffic controller and a trainer here at the Dutch Tra Air Traffic Control Organization in the Netherlands. Do you, um, do you miss the sun? Of course, I do. <laughs> <laughs> now and again, when it comes out, you see me on the streets riding around. Smiling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you run on solar energy almost. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome to the studio and thanks for, for joining us today. Here. Thank you. Adrian, that uh, brings me to you. Uh, your career started out in the safety uh, regulations department of the Civil Aviation Authority of the United Kingdom. You worked as an operations safety program manager at Dutch passenger and cargo uh, airline Martinair. But you also stood on the tarmac and the dirt runways of South Sudan for an aircraft leasing company called Denim Air. Uh, on your LinkedIn profile, and I found that quite interesting, you write that you are specializing in complex aviation issues. Why do you find those complex aviation issues fascinating? What's fascinating about them? Uh, hello, Tom. I suppose there aren't any simple aviation issues. Just, that's, just, that's the first thing. <laughs> Most of our issues are highly complex um, issues. I think when I started my aviation work in the 1980s, we had a much higher accident rate and those who were, uh, than we have today, and we, mo those of us who were looking to go further had to get interested in safety um, and uh, carry on as I started, which then in the, these happy days when we have much more risk than actual lack of safety, uh, that brings you to, to things like performance indicators and, and safety management. So in a way, it's a sort of evolution for you as well. For me, rather than necessarily a, a specific choice of what I wanted to do. So unfortunately, it seems there's no easy topic then in aviation. They're all complex issues. Oh, okay. Well, let's try and uh, demystify a few of them today. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, that brings me to you, uh, Chamsu. Um, by now also a familiar face to our viewers out there in Africa and across the world. Four decades in aviation and still going strong. Um, and you always say it's divided in two parts. The first 20 years roughly was when you were an aviation engineer working with the then existing Air Afrique, uh, engineering and then various different senior management roles including commercial sites and then a switch to the manufacturing world, Boeing, where you were the director of um, Boeing for Africa 
but also involved in, in sales and the commercial side of things. Um, now, recently, you've been bringing new generations of Andorins uh, to, to the planet with your latest grandson being born earlier in the, in the year. Do you see yourself having a role as well to bring new generations of aviation professionals into this world? Well, thank you for the introduction. I hope that uh, we can inspire new generations of aviation professionals uh, from, the, uh, from the continent. Aviation is crucial for the development of, uh, of Africa and, and, and we need uh, young and skilled professionals. And why is it crucial? It's an easy statement to make. Maybe sometimes people think, well, why is it crucial? But I guess it's the distances in particular. And Yeah, Africa is a large continent, as, as we all know. Uh, other modes of transport are not or non-existing or not uh, practical. So aviation is the only, uh, the most accessible, I would say, uh, mode of uh, transport that can connect people. And um, so it's... Uh, it's, it's the easiest way to contribute Bridge those distances. to the development of the continent. Yeah. Okay. Well, gentlemen, today we'll be looking at, um, at three dimensions, if <coughs> you like, of safety performance uh, indicators. Firstly, what type of safety performance indicators are there? Uh, secondly, what would those safety performance indicators, what role do they play in, in safety management? And the third question we'll explore is, do or, or should safety performance indicators play a role in the daily life of operational personnel? Um, Adrian, let me start with you. Uh, you've worked on the topic of SPI, safety performance indicators, quite a lot. First, this basic question, are there, how many types of safety performance indicators are there if you have to generalize? You've got to generalize. Essentially, we have what's called leading and lagging. Yeah. And within both of those sets, we have high and low consequence. So there's a two by two matrix is the simple way. Leading are often positive. They're about what you're doing, where you're going. They're often related to, to the system that you're in or the equipment that you're using, your hardware. And they're probably the most difficult to define, um, which is why most people start with a long, long list of lagging indicators, which are those things that have happened, those things that have gone wrong. Looking back. In Looking a way. backwards. So they are your incident rates. Um, depending on how far you've implemented your, your safety system, it can also relate to how many people are failing trailing events, um, how many things are broken somewhere in the system. And it, we've, we've got an interesting table here today because from the side of manufacture and engineering, we have historically we had much more data to put into management systems than we did from for example from an ANSP. Because the aircraft was <coughs> generating data as well. Aircraft generate data, the regulations in in particularly in terms of design of aircraft and maintenance of aircraft require you to start measuring mean times between failures, uh, failure rates, the failure mode of airworthiness. These are things that have been being measured for an awful long time without it being called safety management mm, and yeah, a number of uh, it was done yeah and a number of other parts of the of the of the aviation industry came later to the game um, in, in terms of producing data or, or indicators if you like looking for the data looking for the do data. we have data the, the answer usually is yes um, mm. is that quantitative qualitative um, and then it the passion of the organization to try and really look for relevant issues is, 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 is absolutely at the, at the heart of this. Um, so if I just take you back briefly, sure. the, the main distinction, if you could say, is those leading and, and lagging indicators. Yep. I found it quite fascinating because when I first heard of those, and I'm, you know, I'm just a silly lawyer, so it's probably down to me not understanding <laughs> these numbers. But, but uh, I found it fascinating because I didn't realize there are many things happening in an organization that you can use as an indicator of how you're doing without looking at an accident or incident. Yeah. Um, Marvin, in, in your line of work uh, as an, uh, a navigation as an air traffic control officer and a trainer. Are there leading indicators you come across that you think are useful for Africa perhaps as well? Leading, but uh, most of the examples I have, unfortunately, they are lagging. Lagging, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I caught but it by I, surprise <laughs> <there>. <laughs> 
But however, in different NSPs, of course, you have different approaches to safety. Mm. And uh, yeah, now I've uh, now that I'm in Europe, I can safely say they were there. Probably they were not uh, described as such mm -hmm. as safety performance skin, maybe uh, leading indicators. But there are safety uh, in interventions that are done in terms of you can name it training, yeah. or maybe in every meeting that that happens. Even now, every monthly meeting, we talk about safety. So that's uh, a, a different way of looking at it, but they are there within the system. And they are not are, labeled as such. But of yeah. course, they are an indication of yeah. you know, what you are doing as an organization in yeah. terms of Correct. Uh, pre, pro, proactively really looking at, at, at the safety uh, side of things. Yeah. Before we go into the, any further discussions, we have to give our viewers their first letter so they have a chance to uh, <laughs> win that $100. The first book uh, today is a book called Going Solo by Roald Dahl. So the letter you need for the code is the Romeo R. Um, beautiful book. Everything that Roald Dahl writes, I think, is, um, yeah, is full of imagination and, and nice things. And he writes quite a lot about aviation. So here's your first book. Um, Adrian, um, back to the, the leading indicator we spoke about yeah. because we have the lagging indicators. But I guess in general, as an industry, we want to increasingly, which is difficult, but move to a proactive setting where we try to do, look at things that happen or we can do <coughs> before yep. something happens. Can you give us some examples maybe of, of leading indicators? Yes, absolutely. As I said, many of them come from the system that you're in. So things uh, like you, you will have various safety forms of safety committee. Um, and you can pick your own way of doing that and uh, of, sorry of the measurement. Are we are we holding without delay, without postponement, our safety committee meetings? What is our performance in that area? Because that is your opportunity to to address to and challenge learn each and other, and to set out the actions that will pick up on the lagging indicators that you've presented there. And you, I'd say, have fun with this. You have to be, <laughs> be careful. Well, it's, good. Well, it's good to have fun um, in safety. We're often too serious. You can count the number of meetings, but you can also count attendance. Um, at one at one organisation where we helped them with their with their uh, management system, we said the meeting hadn't happened in, uh, unless a specific quorum of attendees would be there. Were there in person, so you as the CEO couldn't send an assistant. If you did, you weren't there. Um, because of the decision-making role that that particular meeting had. Yeah, and, and I think also what we have to try and bear in mind, especially for the operators, the smaller operators are looking, you know, maybe not the, the large airlines, but who are just setting off for maybe a small ANSP starting mm -hmm. in Africa uh, with the issue of safety performance indicators that um, maybe also we should make them too complex in the beginning, I guess, to, yeah. to start yeah. with. Um, Chamsu, in your time, at Air Afrique, but maybe more recently as well. Uh, did safety performance indicators emerge in your work, how to say? Yes, and you cannot, as you said uh, in your introduction, you cannot manage what you don't measure. And before, when you measure, you have to uh, identify the indicators of that measurement. So, and I fully, uh, I like the, leading and lagging indicators <laughs> uh, indicated by uh, Adrian. And, and I, I was thinking that even the leading indicators are usually based on, uh, it's, it's a, it refers to the precursor of something that you want to monitor. Yeah. Yeah. But it always happened after the precursors, yeah. but before what you want to measure. That's why we call them leading. Yeah. If you take, uh, if we take the uh, oversight capability, for instance, mm. you, you you measure the uh, the oversight capability, and and you li you link it to the uh, performance of the operators. But it's because you but you measure the the capability. Of the government, of the oversight. Of the government, yeah. of the oversight organization, by what is missing, but what, what is not done right. But what, what you are actually focusing on is the, uh, uh, the, the uh, integrity of the system on the, at the operation level. So it depends on the way you define your system. 
then you can define what is leading, uh, what 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 are you going to monitor yeah. in, in order to be uh, predictive of in in the system or what you are going to do to, uh, as a pro, as a um, reactive indicators to correct the system something Absolutely, that goes yeah. wrong so but uh, all that depends on the concept of the system and I think also initially, especially when there's a, it's a small operator starting out with it, I think the trick is to keep it simple because otherwise it yes. becomes too co complex. One really nice tool, and we'll make it available uh, uh, in the uh, subscription of this uh, YouTube clip when it comes onto YouTube, but we worked with Belfast City Airport in uh, Ethiopia, actually, and they shared an Excel file uh, which they used at Belfast City Airport, so a major international intercontinental airport actually, and they said, you know, we don't have the wherewithal, the money to buy an expensive system, and we work with Excel, and of course, every office in Africa nowadays, you know, whether it is a legal copy or an illegal copy, they will have Excel. <laughs> so that's maybe also something, Adrian, not to, to look at these simple yeah, tools. You don't have to yeah. go out and buy expensive software. Yeah. There comes a point when you do need it, there is a... Um, a moment at which when you are large enough to integrate your incident investigation with your compliance system, with your indicators, and you, Excel is not a system tool in, in, in that sense. But when you're starting small, something like Excel uh, or, a, or a small database can be, a good can be start, a very yeah. useful start. And you do have to start simple. Yeah. But there are two essential things here, I think, that are not always really realized is that the effort you're putting in says a lot about what's called your risk appetite. Okay. Which we could do another 45 minutes on just risk <laughs> appetite. <laughs> but it is as it sounds, it is how much risk do you as you a company, as a, as, a, as a shareholder group or as an individual person, are you prepared to take? And it's a conscious thing, risk appetite. It's not the things you forget to do, it's the things that you go out to work every day saying, I think this is fine. What are we willing to accept? What are we willing to <laughs> accept? And the greater your risk appetite, if you're looking at um, what ultimately in, the, in, in, in Patrick Hudson's organizational cultural model was called a, called a generative system, where you're really creating models for your own use and for others, like Belfast, um, comes to a point where you say, I know exactly how much risk I've got is that much. And I'm happy, I'm happy with that. And the other, other side of that goes back to, to the former um, or a previous defense minister in the US government, Donald Rumsfeld, who was pilloried at the time when he spoke, and it had to do with the Iraq war, of known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns. Yeah. Known unknowns are an evidence of a poor attitude to risk appetite. Because you're saying, I know there's something out that, you know, that'll bite me. But I don't have any idea how close I am to it. Yeah. Um, you know, you pitch, you pitch your tent next to the lions. <laughs> how, but I haven't measured how far um, and how many fences are between me and them. That's you really know what your, your risks are that you're exposed yeah. to. And trying to get a grip of your known unknowns that's a way you can also start to look at um, at your risk appetite. And then look for safety performance indicators that help you uh, move that needle almost, improve. Absolutely. Your, uh, that's, that's where you try and get. And, and, and so there are examples as you go further, because you can start with the, what is my rate of, of X going wrong. But later you can also start to balance some of your operational uh, aspiration versus your safety performance which becomes really interesting when you put them on a seesaw. So how many, uh, we were discussing, Marvin and I, uh, earlier, uh, an example. How many times am I act on my aircraft going unscheduled, unserviceable, AOG, yeah. as we call it? Aircraft on ground. Versus how many defects are we deferring? Postponing, Postponing maintenance basically. action. Yeah. Yeah. There's a balance in there because if I say, oh, I have a very low AOG rate, that could be because I'm carrying a huge risk. Yeah. By all these deferred bits because of Because I say, oh, that's broken, that's broken, that's broken. Um, and it's going to bite me. Yeah. But if you then have a, you have a ratio, so I'm not looking to have, I'm looking for a balance between how much am I writing in my deferred list and how many times am I going AOG? That, that's a bit of a steer. 
Yeah. And then you mine into that, and when it does happen, where did it happen? Was it which which one of your fleet was it? What what was the trigger? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, where you don't have where you don't have line maintenance because that's Murphy's law. Mm-hmm. When it it'll does happen, happen where you don't have line maintenance. It'll just before dark in an airport yeah. which doesn't work at night, and you don't have a maintenance employee there. <laughs> okay. Okay, so this link of risk appetite, and I, I personally thought when I first heard these words, risk appetite, I thought it's quite complex. You know, what, what is risk appetite? It's basically how much risk are you willing to take yeah. as a small operator, as an ANSP, or, or as an airport. It's time, gentlemen, for our second letter of the day, for the, <laughs> the, um, the US, 100 US dollars that you can win out there. And this time it's a book that uh, Marvin took along. <laughs> um, it's by a gentleman called Gordon Ramsay, so we're looking for the letter G, the golf. It's a cookbook. He's quite a famous uh, cook in uh, in Western Europe in particular. Does that mean you are a fond cook yourself? Uh? <laughs> it's, it's interesting how when you see his face, you can know how him chanting and throwing things around, but uh, that can take you aback, but look at what he produces after that. Then the quality you, of his work. You'll be attracted to the quality of his work. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to the way of doing things. It's different, but uh, it achieves uh, the targets. So one day I think we have to find a, um, a roaming camera and go to his kitchen. He'll cook a meal for us and we'll see if you've picked up the traits from, uh, from Gordon Ramsay. Um, okay, now if I, while we're at you, uh, with you actually, um, Marvin, uh, one of the things we also like to talk about a little bit is what role do safety performance indicators play or should they play in, in the Operational reality, you know, if you look at you at the uh, your daily performance, yeah. what role should you play? And I remember when we spoke about this beforehand, yeah. uh, you mentioned of this sort of one of the airfields you worked at, the, the scorecard that was yeah, kept. Yeah, yeah, Tell yeah. us a bit about that, how that worked. For me, that the thing that strikes me the most is on the operational floor, are the people working there conscious about the idea behind the safety uh, performance indicators. Some of them have no clue and yet they're generating probably the data that is used to come up with the, 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 the information. So at one of the ANSP I worked for, they had a simple thing. It was not expensive. They just printed a chart the safety performance indicator was just the number of ATC-related incidents. Yeah. And the target was two safety, ATC-related safety uh, uh, okay, uh, incidents per 10,000 movement. Okay. So there was a chart, number of incidents, and of course time for the month. So the goal was two. And each time the leaders there would just uh, plot a simple graph. Yeah. to say, okay, we are here, we are above the target or below the target. Each time, as you enter into the operational room, you'd meet that chart. <laughs> it Obviously, in you. one way or the other, it communicates safety. It communicates what everybody is about to say, okay, are we above or below is something to think about. So it doesn't have to be expensive, it, but it's a subtle way of communicating uh, your safety, uh, uh, safety to the people on the on the ground. The workflow, who, yeah. who have to deliver the safety in the end. Eh? Yes. Because in the end, only yeah. you can target safety. Yeah. Uh, indeed. Yeah. yeah. I think and that brought me to uh, um, a point that I wanted to discuss with uh, with, well, with all of you actually. But you know, you mentioned this the, the, these controllers going um, to the workflow and, and a scorecard being held. Um, I think, Jamsu, what you what I've seen and probably you've seen the same in your forty years in Africa is that. When organizations or companies start out with safety performance indicators, they quite often say it has to be zero. You know, we want to have zero bird strikes, zero runway incursions. From your experience, is that, is that stimulating? Is that realistic to always aim for zero? Um, it, it's obviously, it's, I would say it's emotional. You, you want zero default. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would put it as emotion. But now, when you look at, you start looking at, uh, you, uh, facts, you realize that uh, you can. It can never be zero. In most cases, so anyway, yeah. uh, even if uh, you say I want to be zero, I call it as, as uh, an aspiration. But then you have to look at the trend and see this is my baseline, and it's it's not zero, but that's where I stand today. And what do I do to improve it? And and. And you 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 start uh, 
you you do incremental improvements yeah. to the and as you do that, there is a cost associated also with changing with that changing number. that uh, level, and you reach a point where maybe the cost associated is not worth the additional uh, improvement safety benefit yeah and, and the safety benefit. And when you, it's very tricky what I'm saying because someone will say, oh, because of the cost, we are not going to zero. No, uh, you, there are, there are non-acceptable situation when it affects, when the consequences are uh, high enough, uh, you have to address them. But sometimes the consequences are acceptable and the cost associated to go further are too high. Unreasonable, yeah. Unreasonable. That's also what I care about. Acceptable level of safety. Yes, and you have to make that balance. So the notion of acceptable level of safety is quite uh, difficult to understand. But yeah. that's the reality that you cannot get zero, um, zero default. There will be a certain level of default that will have minimal impact on the system. Of the operation. And, yeah. uh, and that is where you need to to, 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 to position yourself. And I think that also brings the point that Adrian brought, the risk appetite, you know, and, yes. and, the, and the number you mentioned actually, yeah. like two air proxies per month or something. Yeah. Yeah. At some point in time, you have to have the discussion, is that what we find acceptable in our organization? Yeah. Could I just take one of Chamsu's ideas and stretch it a wee bit further? An essential point of ICAO Annex 19 for safety management is, con is the idea of continuous improvement. Yeah. If I set my targets all at zero, and I hit them, what, my, what do I do? Do I, do I say, I, do I stop safety? <laughs> <laughs> um, because the industry, the operating environment is evolving at a, at a pace that you may not necessarily mean that you'll stay at zero. Because you might grow, your operations you might, might grow, grow, the world around you might change. The I, but so the idea of setting your two per 10,000 is great, but when you consistently hit two, two uh, per 10,000, Lower it. Yeah. Although I can imagine there may also be situations when you simply say we want to sustain, maintain what we have. That can, Otherwise, like Jamzu says, it's going to be yeah. f you know, irresponsible or unreasonably expensive to, to correct. But as a, as a, even as a small organization, you're going to have a suite of, I'd say, minimum 8 to 12 uh, indicators. So you're never going to get all of them. Oh, we're happy with everything. No. But finding a, me a method of, and it's also when you first set your indicator, I mean, that number of two didn't come out of nowhere. Yeah. So if you're running at a rate of, 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 of 10, you think, well, okay, that, that's now an ambitious target. Yeah. To, to try and, and to reduce it down. To, yeah. 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 But if you, if you were running at 1.8 per 10,000, they say, ah, let's set it to two. <laughs> that's the cynicism that we, that, that we don't want to see. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's part of setting these, these, uh, these levels up. ICAO has on its website a indicator catalog which can give a few interesting examples to, to people. Who are starting out who or learning about it. Who are starting out yeah. or, or looking to, to, to you mentioned improve it. Eight or 10, but maybe that's a good starting point, not to be again too ambitious. I'd say if you end up with 50 or 60, um, mm -hmm. when are you going to have time to put them into their context? And to, and to capture the data for it and to yeah. keep Absolutely, track of yeah. it. Yeah. And you can, I mean, flight data monitoring systems with airlines, 748 yes. is an excellent example. We were talking with them a while back. They've even got data monitoring in aircraft that is too small to have to have it by regulation. But they choose it, yeah. But they're choosing to collect thousands of data points per flight. Uh, but indeed, like I said, that's generated by the aircraft, of course. In many cases, when we speak of, of an airport or an ANSP, yeah. maybe you may not have that digital data available. ANSPs, digital ANSPs will as well, mm. of all sorts of data. Air uh, proxies or... Uh, yeah. Exactly. We don't wait for the... The air proxies, the unwanted is the unwanted precursor of the collision. The collision, we want, we'll set that at zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Proxies will set at X. But before that, you've got a percentage loss of separation. Yeah. A serious... Uh, a, a which you could define as a... Which you can define, and if game. you're on a digital uh, ATC system, you'll have an opportunity to, to create readouts of, of contacts as they pass each yeah. other. Yeah. Uh, I feel like a game show host actually by now, <laughs> but it's, it's time for the third letter. Uh, this is a book uh, called Airframe by Michael Christian. So we're looking for the 
M, the mic, which will be the third and last letter you need for your three-letter code. This is a book, uh, Adrian, you've read. I have, yes. Why uh, did you sort of bring it to the studio today? Yeah. In a way, it's a bit, it's a bit of an illustrative of some of the, 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 the gains and pitfalls of, of safety management. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it's a very exciting story about uh, aviation safety. Um, I, I understand it's allegedly based on the MD-11's development, which is a favorite aircraft of mine from oh, my past. <laughs> <laughs> but then it takes all sorts of twists and turns and may not be wholly illustrative of the truth. Of the truth, but a good of, read nonetheless. That's a very good read. <laughs> um, so having this book is to me a nice, a nice little link to the idea that your management reports, they can be a fantastic read. <laughs> but are they actually representative the truth. of what yeah. your organization is doing just now? Yeah. I must say, if it's I a little too exciting, yeah. you're probably going the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say, I have read it myself as well. And it, particularly, for example, for the future aviation professionals, you know, watching this episode, it makes a really nice read and a fair good understanding of how the system of designing an aircraft yep. uh, works. So here's Adrian's recommendation. Back uh, away from the game show we are. Yep. <laughs> Back to, uh, um, so we're nearing the end of you know, today's focus session. We still have a few moments of time. But so what I would like to do is um, ask each of you one suggestion you might have for the viewers out there to help them improve uh, their use of safety performance indicators because some operators actually don't use it yet, you know, because it, it yeah. seems complicated. And especially if you only think, from my experience, of those lagging indicators, it's sometimes difficult um, to, to start with. But we've, we've learned from Adrian today as well that there are these leading indicators and you spoke about it as well. Um, so what would be this one low hanging fruit? Um, Marvin, if I can start with you, what comes to your mind? What comes to my mind is it doesn't have to be expensive for you to communicate uh, safety performance indicators to the people on the shop floor. It can be a simple a chart diagram that you, yeah. that's hung in an operational room and that invokes something. You, you want to generate interest and people become knowledgeable in, in safety. Because we are in safety, it's critical that you, you communicate such important information. Yeah, and I think what is, of course, then important is what you quite often see at notice boards in Africa and probably across the world as well, but I only work in Africa, is that that same chart will then stay there for three years to go. Yeah, so I think the without trick is, of being course, updated. It, yeah, yeah. it, has, to course, updated. it has to be updated. Of course, it has to be explained and people know what it is. But at the end of the day, when you look at it once, you get a plot of where you are in terms of your performance as an organization with regards to safety. And, and before I come to you, gentlemen, I also think of this anecdote that you spoke of in uh, the discussions we had before the, the broadcast, uh, where in one operator, one uh, service provider you worked, there was a system of linking safety performance scoring to a bonus point. Yeah. System? How, yeah. how, how, tell us a bit about that. <laughs> that was interesting in the same organization where we had the charts. So it was, um, again, they said if you exhibit a safety conscious attitude or act yeah. and your colleagues um, uh, notices it, there was a, a portal that will go in and we score some points for you. So maybe For the you, person who did well. For the person who did well. So by... At the end of the day, you, you could collect points based on your, uh, on your whatever you did, and yeah. that was noticed by your colleagues. And then you could go into an online store and buy things like physical things, like cameras. With those points. With those points. So that was a way of uh, you know, uh, motivating people to be interested in safety and looking at what their colleagues are doing, as, as well as uh, reward the same uh, good efforts towards safety. So not frequent flying miles, but frequent good behavior miles. Yeah, good like behavior, <laughs> so to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and did it work? Was it not abused by people? Or it, it worked for a while, but then, uh, of course, it, there were some issues with it, and then they stopped. But the idea behind it, I loved it at all, because people would start talking about it. What, what behavior did you exhibit today? Something what are like your that. points? Yeah. What are your points? And people would actually compete to say, I've got more points, and that incites people to start talking about uh, safety. So, so maybe, again, I guess with, with safety promotion, we always have to keep it innovative and fresh and new. So maybe yeah. something like that can work for a year or two years, but then maybe you have to move on to yeah. a different... Something else. Yeah, yeah. To something yeah. else yeah. to keep it rewarding. Adrian, your sort of one golden tip or 
tip for tip. people to improve? I think Marvin's hinted on a number of these things and it's got to do with the relevance to the company and it being alive within their company. So it has to consider the cognitive behavior of the staff. Cognitive behavior. How do we actually work? Okay. Not how do we think we should work. Okay. And that touches on a subject for which we don't have enough time for today, but just culture. Yeah. <laughs> the opposite of your reward system. Yeah. That I punish you for yeah. getting it wrong. Which yeah. we don't want, right? Just to no, because you'll, you'll, get, you'll, you'll get no uh, qualitative data from people. If I, if I open my mouth when something's gone wrong yeah. with a view to improving it and I get fired, well, the first one might do it, but the second or third will surely keep their mouths yeah. shut. Yeah. Yeah. So it has also a balance across the company. And the further it goes from the operational departments, the better. Ultimately, you want sales, human factors, uh, human resources. You want everyone involved in, in, in this. It's something... For, it's in, something in, in, the cul in the safety in culture. In the sa safety the culture, so the indicators can relate to staffing levels and why people left so quickly. That might not be a reflection on the staff. It might be a reflection on the hiring policies. Yeah. And this, it doesn't last forever. You have to monitor what you're, not only what you're doing, take action on it, but monitor at a higher level and see when is it time we've changed. We, we, we're, we, our risk appetite has moved on. Our destinations are changing. Yeah. We have to change then some of the indicators. And you'll add a couple and you'll drop a couple. And you keep that going over time. And I think what's also the point you're bringing up that links to these saving up for fridges, basically. I think, yeah. you know, <laughs> what, 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 well, I mean, what we increasingly also want to do as a safety community across the world, whether it's Africa or not, I think, which I think is really fascinating, is, you know, what they call safety 2.0, where we don't look at things that went wrong and learn from them, but look at things that go well oh. and yeah. learn from those, which is in a way yeah. you know, linking to yeah. this, this bonus point. But... Um, have you worked with those kind of? Uh, yeah, certainly. I was, I was thinking. Well? I was. I was thinking of one which, which is far simpler and, and quite quite much older. Uh, originates from the U.S. military. It's called the Golden Bolt. And it's a big sort of naval or maritime size nut and bolt. Yeah. yeah. You know, not it's the that big. It's that big. Okay. <laughs> it's spray painted gold. Yeah. And a supervisor will, at a particular moment, once every whatever their cycle is put it into a piece of ground, ground servicing equipment yeah. because it is a instruction and a procedure. And here we get co to cognitive uh, relevance. You pre-flight all your GSE. Your ground service equipment. Yeah. Before you drive it onto the ap apron and start approaching the aircraft, you check everything's okay. Yeah. So he, whoever's running this puts the, this golden bolt somewhere in an area behind a panel that you are meant to open. To see if somebody... Yeah, and when someone eventually finds it, they get given a cash uh, in the US, sort of $150 or whatever. Really? Okay. Yeah, and then uh, uh, this is where it gets uh, difficult, I think, from the sort of the human performance thing. They'll put on the notice board that uh, Marvin uh, found yesterday the golden bolt in, in vehicle X, and we had put it there three weeks ago. Have Ooh. you driven X in the last three weeks? <laughs> and why didn't you find it? That's a very nice one, yeah. <laughs> and that's where it starts to, it's a bit of a sort of negative, yeah. negative uh, So you have to be careful how you communicate it. Yeah. Absolutely. But, the idea but, is to throw it in a mix, you know, of, yeah. of sometimes doing the system you described, sometimes doing this, yeah. to keep yeah. people alert. Yeah. Because if it, if it stays on too long, yeah. you know, no matter what system it is, people yeah. get wary yeah. and, and they find ways around to getting that golden yeah. bolt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so your, your suggestion, your one golden bolt would literally be a golden bolt? Um, one golden bolt could be a golden bolt. <laughs> why not? Because I've got a long list of other things, but uh, <laughs> for today, let's leave it. Think of something like a golden bolt, bolt project, a Ford Walk project, um, yeah, something to engage brains yeah. um, of, your, of your staff. And I, I know that there's quite a lot of operators in Africa already who have something like you know, the safety champion of the month and mm. all these things. But we, the, the more fresh ideas we can give to all these professionals to keep it engaging, the, the better. Yep. So thanks so yep. much, uh, Adrian. You're welcome. Chamsu, we get to you. What would be your suggestion? You know, what do you think they can, based if you look back at your 40 years, you know, what could be a, a good step for them to take? Or how could they take a first step in this SPI process, safety performance indicators? I think the indicators should be relevant to the people and not necessarily, not, keep it simple and re relevant to the to the people and they can measure their own progress okay. towards uh, the common goal if uh, 
For instance, uh, my work is um, uh, at the floor, shop floor. Don't don't give me, uh, don't overload me with indicators, boardroom indicators, or, or so, cockpit indicators. Cop- or, yeah, yeah, it's it might help because it's the big picture, but give me something that is relevant to what I do, how I can improve on that. And I think uh, just keep it simple and uh, expect uh, incremental small small changes. changes. But I think that's a very good point to make sure that whatever SPI you define for the maintenance department or the safety department or the ground service equipment, that it's it's relevant and it relates Especially, I think, to people that are on the sharp end, you know, the people that are loading the aircraft or the controllers that do the controlling or, you know, the, the uh, technicians that maintain a navigational beacon to make sure that it's relevant indeed. Yeah. So that means you have to involve those professionals when yes. you define those SPIs, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, otherwise, you run the risk of people that don't have the domain expertise to say, this is going to be our safety performance indicator. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Gentlemen. I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. Uh, thank you very much for joining me here in the, in the Tata studio in uh, Hilversum in the Netherlands. And thank you also to the viewers out there. Thank you for tuning in for safety promotion because that's what you've done today. Uh, if you enjoyed today's focus session, then be our ambassador and tell your friends about the work of AVS Assist and about these focus sessions. If you want to support our work, become a friend of AVS Assist, become a member uh, in our web shop at www.aviasis.org forward slash shop. Uh, and you can pay in many ways, including mobile money. So we try to also listen to what our customers want, and that's being able to pay easily. Uh, and I can assure you, your support will go a long way because we work really hard to keep our overhead cost really low. To give you a good example, we have no offices. We all work from our home environment and that saves a lot of money. Then also we have a lot of partners who provide us with in-kind support, the studio here being a very good example. Um, we'd love to also welcome you to our first Aviasist Safety Promotion Center, the ASPC Rwanda. Come and work towards your certificates in one of our unique courses at the University of Rwanda. And please don't forget, only you can target safety. Join us for the next focus session as we continue our mission with you to improve African aviation safety. For now, Murabejo and have a good day.